We're good. Okay. Hi, everybody. Those of you who came in and uh, braved the elements, thank you. So this is our plan for today. We are going to try to make this as interactive as possible. And also, we are both available and around our details. So if you don't get your question answered, feel free to reach out. But just to show of hands for those of you that are here, who has actually heard of an employer brand before? OK, so 30%. So this will be useful. And we're going to really discuss how that is relevant to hiring for talent and not just the talent who applies or just the talent that you know someone who knows someone expanding your network to try to have more diversity, which is difficult, especially for founders, because you really want to start with people you trust, and then successfully getting your employer brand top, et cetera. So a little bit about TalentWorks. Why am I here to talk about this? We are what you call a talent attraction firm. So whether it's recruiting, researching, um, being able to provide a digital brand, being able to help get candidates aware of your business, whether you're five employees or 5,000 or 50,000, that's what we do. We've been doing that for you know pretty much about 14 years globally. I run the US out of Boston, and then we have um, our headquarters and a lot of our team sits in Europe as well. So we do work with a lot of clients that are trying to balance between both, both, both sides of the Atlantic. Um, I'm, I live in Adic, so local born and bred, and it's been really interesting to see what's happening here in Boston, especially where we are in the seaport. So exciting times to be an innovative company here in Boston, and, and hopefully today we're going to be able to give you some good advice. As far as companies that we've worked with, I think you'll get a sense, and you've probably heard of some of these, and some of them you don't know because they're scaling startup businesses like yourself. And the point of this slide is to say, We've seen it all before. So whether you are making your first hire or your 50th hire, or you're trying to make your business plan to get the financing to grow, um, that's really what we as a business has specialized in. And we've had the ability to do that with great clients like Janielle, who I asked to join us today. Thanks, Jody. Hi, everyone. I'm Janielle Newland. I am also uh, Boston born and raised. You could throw a rock at um, where I grew up from here. Um, but I've had the pleasure of working around the globe in human resources and in particular um, recruiting. Hiring is far more fun than firing people, let me tell you. So I do enjoy the, the recruiting aspect. And, you know, I've worked at a lot of great companies um, and I started my own consulting business as well. Uh, have to hire from myself, my own team. So uh, sometimes I'm my own customer. So I do uh, really understand where you're coming from. Uh, just a sample of some of the companies I've worked with, uh, particularly in biopharma, anywhere from 11 employees uh, with Genovant seeking funding during a pandemic. Um, to companies like Covidian, which is uh, back in the day used to be on the the first company to be on the wall of the green monster at at the Red Sox, to uh, global companies like EMD Millipore, where um, I was running a team doing uh, 1,200 hires a year in 52 countries, um, and Jody and I did projects at all of these organizations together. And it was always um, employer brand based. It's so much bigger than recruiting. Recruiting is a posting, but how do you attract people to you? So um, Jody helped me develop a brand at Genovant, um, launch uh, the first immuno oncology drug and sales force with EMD Millipore. Um, so, you know, it's, it's the same um, work to be good, to create a brand that's going to attract people to come and work for you or want to work for you or realize they're too different um, and, and they want different things. And, and that's why I've continued to, to work with Judy as she's, she's helped me um, build out all these companies. Thank you. And I think part of why I asked Janielle is, when I've sat through presentations like this, it can get frustrating when someone's talking about a big global plan and that's not where you are. And I think we both have done that career shift from big, big company to startup to big company to startup 
we've we've decided we're good at startups and scale ups and TalentWorks is also a, a scaling business. Um, it was 40 people when I joined um, almost nine years ago. I was the first U.S. person, and now we're double that, sort of approaching 100 employees globally with you know functions in South Africa extended. So. I think that what we want to make sure you get out of today is everything is customizable. And we may talk about some examples that may seem like more established businesses, but at one point they were you. So what is an EVP and why do you need one? And I'm going to let Janielle speak through this because this is her favorite slide. This is really my favorite slide. I've stole it from Jody years ago. So a lot of people ask, or wonder, including my parents still, after 25 years in the business, what the hell do we do in human resources? Um, so this, for me, the center of the graph um, really encapsulates a lot about what we're, or everything in terms of what we're trying to do to get talent and keep it. It's a scary slide because you see like all these things that you have to do, a career site, you know, in, induction programs. But really, um, I want you to focus on the, the middle. You want to make people aware of your company and what you're planning to do. So awareness, attraction, you want to do something to ensure you're putting that message out there recruitment, you know, it's a good process. How many people get ghosted, you know, in interview processes? They do it to HR people too, you know? So, um, you know, getting in, you get a reputation. So what should your recruitment process be like? And now you have the people, what the hell do you do with them? You have to engage them and retain them. Um, I always joke um, when I work up, when I work with um, founders and startups, and they're very focused on um, getting the employees and they get so excited and we get them and then they go, oh shoot, what do I do with them now? And I'm busy writing them and onboarding and helping them think through, well, what are, you, you know, what are your benefits? How are we going to keep these people? How are we going to keep them happy? So really just at this stage, you want to think about that center. Um, and, and sometimes all you can do is just get the recruitment right. Just have a good experience. If you're talking to people and interviewing them, you know, be honest and open with them and follow up with them and say, I thought you were great, but I found another fit. So um, as you continue to grow and evolve, just continue to do each part of that process right. And then really only, the only organizations that are doing all of these buckets are the, the larger organizations. But it's a great slide to think about, well, what can I be doing and what should I be thinking about as it relates to um, retention and engagement? And I think the answers to what are we known for? Why do people want to work for us? What's unique? That will shift and change as your business shifts and changes. And so this is always on and always moving. And I think that, you know, back in the day when we did some of our earlier work, you could spend three, six months working on an employer brand, getting that approved by marketing teams, go to launch, redo your website. It's think about where we were six months ago and think about where we'll be in six months. Nobody really knows. So I think it is having agility and flexibility and sort of that true north of regardless of how many employees, regardless of a new product launch, this is kind of what I see as our DNA or the Kool-Aid I want everyone to drink. And the good EVP is going to help you not only center yourself and your exec team and your board, but it's going to help really good talented candidates self-select in or self-select out. And that's, you know, that's okay because you're busy. You don't want to be spending a lot of time with someone who's fantastic on paper, but they're just not going to be a culture fit. We're all too busy for that right now. So whether you have a handful of employees or tenfold, these are the things that I would, I'm just going to take a minute and walk through the headers. And obviously you have the presentation of what I would ask yourself as some homework, you know, what are those internal positives? Is it not just what you do make problem you're solving, but 
what can you say consistently to candidates that is going to be true and have something special about working for you? What are those points of differentiation, which might just be, you know, something a little bit different now in this hybrid world? It used to be the cool office and the foosball table and the drinks and the free food, but that may not be consistently what you're offering, or it might be, and that might be the differentiator. You're like, hey, we are still together in person. Come, come hang out. So what can you do to motivate the right type of candidate to come? Right now, regardless if you're hiring someone who's at the very first tip of their career or 20 years into it, they want to know that you're thinking about not only your business, but their career. And Janelle does that better than many, many HR folks I've worked with. So it's never too early to think about the career path. Um, it's never too early to think about the perception of that experience from a candidate, even if they're not the right candidate today. Because that person who's too junior today might be exactly the developer you need in two years. So you don't want them to have a bad experience. And it's hard to do that when you're overwhelmed with just trying to get the business going. So what is that perception? And in some cases, people make an assumption, you know, we work with Vertex down the street. You know, we, we work with some, some big name companies and some small companies. Sometimes being unknown and neutral is easier because you can really control that narrative and go into the market and a little bit of what we're doing right now with um, Viridian. And sometimes having an established name comes with that baggage and that perception. Or people only know of you of, you know, I've worked with BJs and people can't imagine that they need a sophisticated marketing and IT team, but they do. Not everybody is working the register. So it's getting over that, that hump. Um, being aware enough to look around at the talent competitors. And that doesn't necessarily mean the same industry. So who else is hiring Ruby developers? You know, who else is hiring project managers? What are they offering? What's special and different? What are the, who are the companies that you feel, wow, they do things really well? You know, I want to try to get some folks from here to come. So let me look and see what benefits they offer. And that all comes down to what, you know, sort of the vernacular is the USP, that unique selling proposition. Just like your business plan, hey, this is what's special, why I deserve funding. It's that same approach. This is what's special, candidate come to us, and it won't necessarily be the most money. Okay. Jody, if I can make one point, it's just like with investors, they want to know what's in it for me, right? So the employees, the people potentially coming to work for you also want to know, okay, I'm going to get a paycheck. But people want so much more. So what's in it for me? I come, I do your work. Yeah, you give me a paycheck. So you should be thinking about it in that same terms that you're thinking about it with your investors. And there is a business case. And if you see these stats, you know, it's much less expensive to recruit for a company that people have heard of. And it doesn't mean they've heard of you on what you do, heard of you as an employer. Um, you're going to get more qualified applicants. I just finished doing some of the research for Viridian, and I was amazed at the quality and the caliber of some people who actually direct applied, which I haven't seen in years for the, usually the types of roles that I'm working with. So you want to be able to control that buzz as much as you can. And job seekers are willing to come for less salary, especially as this shift has happened the last sort of 90 days with the economy, if they feel like there's a promise and there's sort of other support. You know, right now, mental health, flexibility, there's a whole bunch of different things that folks are looking for beyond salary. And they can jump around as much as they want. So what's going to be the reason that they're going to come and stay and, and be able to you know, grow with you? And then being able to put that into a framework that says, here are a couple of supporting pillars that we've, we've tested. Sometimes you can use a firm like ours. Sometimes you can just do surveying. Sometimes you can do workshops yourself. But let's figure out what it is that's going to make it sort of special and true so that someone doesn't go into market and say, hey, here's three things about us. And then suddenly glass door is blowing up and saying that's not true. So there's always an aspiration. But you want to make sure it's valid or it's emerging. And you can say that. Like with diversity messaging, 
people will honestly say, we are working towards this, which is better than, you know, sticking sort of stock photography on there and somebody takes the job and says, this is not what I was expecting. Um, I'm going to let Janielle share just a couple of the outputs of what EVP research does, because I think this will explain a little bit about what do you, what do you mean? Like, what are those ingredients that's going to be something special? So Viridian started with three people, uh, entirely remote company. It was the third remote company that uh, our CEO had created. So I always say we did remote before it was cool and necessary. Um, but the, the important factor there is they had already had really good remote experience. And I'll loop back to that in, in a second. But um, his, the CEO's name is Jonathan Violin, grew up here in Massachusetts uh, as well. And he had a pretty good point of view in creating the company of what he wanted. Uh, academic uh, initial background in sciences, uh, moved on, received his PhD, and then went into the business world on business development, investing or helping uh, biotechs raise raise capital. So he took his science piece and 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 pivoted to raising capital, and and created Viridian. Um, he had some interesting points of view. Um, I don't know if I can swear, but um, he didn't want to work with, you know, a dot dot dot. You know. Uh, I call them genius jerks. Um, other people have a, have a different word for it. But he, in his own career, had worked with really smart people, but they were jerks. They were, and in, in, in creating his own company, he went into it with just that thought. I want to make really good science and I want to work with good people. And over time, that evolved. Okay, to be successful here, he started to see it. Everyone has to be able to work remote effectively. Well, what does that mean with a group of people that, to be honest, are typically very introverted, right? You have to want to connect. You have to want to be curious and, and reach out in, in, in a virtual environment. So he started to distill down his own point of view and build the company. Now, I... I come in, I bring Jody in. We had some really successful people and we had some not successful people. So Jody's process really helped us flesh out what does good look like at Viridian? You can meet, and I'm sure you know, amazing, intelligent people that you would never want to work with or you might not work well together. So just hiring someone and picking someone because someone recommended them or they're really elite, the elite athlete in their field doesn't mean it's the right mix for your business. Um, so Jody, I'll, I'll have you explain what you, what you did after you, um, at that point. Great. So, so the research came from a couple different data points. So stakeholder interviews, focus groups, and then we kind of drilled down and said, you know, what are some of those themes? And and, you know, the folks that were there and engaged, you know, appreciated that perception that you could be yourself. It was a safe place to work. It was a, a little bit of a low risk. They are public already. Um, they There isn't an ego with sort of the product line because it is very much, we want to use what's working best to get to yes. And I think people appreciated that. Still having the entrepreneurial experience without risk and being able to really be clear. And I think Janielle's team, really said, we don't want to have somebody not take the job because we don't have a 401k or we don't have enough vacation time. So being able to look for, you know, PPO and different partners to be able to match the benefits of bigger companies has been key and critical. And I do think something that is difficult. Like when I started TalentWorks US, you know, we didn't have enough employees to get anything reasonable. So I, you know, I did a brief window of sort of giving people a stipend for mass health and that wasn't great, you know? So then we, we went through and said, okay, we need to have another company that's going to give us the benefit of being a 50 plus person company to have those, those benefits, the training, the EAP, all those types of things. And you pay for that, but that is, that is a huge savings in the long run because that's support that you, you know, even if you have an HR team, HR teams need help too. 
And if I can just say employee three, um, who is help, helping run the Viridian business today, um, accepted the job, uh, having never seen the CEO, her husband said, can you Google him so I can see if he's real? Um, you know, did it all an online interview. They had no physical building. So um, she was so impassioned by the message, his vision, his vision of a company um, and what he wanted to do scientifically. She was willing, grown woman, four years in industry experience in some of the most amazing organizations you'll, you'll see in science. Signed up, say, okay, we'll figure out the benefits, those sorts of things. So that's the, the power of an EVP. Now we have all the benefits. Jonathan's real. We actually have a physical building now. <laughs> but, um, you know, in, in his vision wasn't salient yet. It wasn't completely thought out in this um, process really helped us get there. But that, I think that story illustrates that if you know what you want to do and you have passion about it, it'll build on itself and, and you should, you should share that. And we had some, some really great selling points come out of these interviews that, that Jody did with our existing staff to say, okay, why is this a special place to work? You know, who will be successful here? Who will be able to work here and, and survive? Yeah. So I think, you know, after you get the research, you get to the fun stuff. So iRobot, probably a company everyone's heard of, even iRobot, you know, a few years ago. Is it cool and exciting to work on vacuums? Look at all the cool stuff everyone in this room is doing. So being able to really share what they've been doing about, you know, especially um, supporting women and, and giving more flexibility, you know, pre-COVID, being able to give them a little bit of a facelift. So you know, we're going to do some interactive exercises for everybody. Um, and before we do that, I think just, just really take a, a quick moment to think about EVP is messaging and advertising and marketing and culture is culture and they do go hand in hand. And I think that, you know, it's very easy to think they're one in the same or values are the same, but, but they're not always the same. So sometimes the values are, you know, aspirational, and the culture is we're drinking through the fire hose right now. Um, the priority is you know, getting to the next stage or getting a product launched or getting to our 10th employee or whatever that might be. So just having messaging that's sort of value-based may not tell the full story. So if everybody has their phones, I'm, I'm breaking all the rules in a presentation. The last thing you want to do, and I have two teenagers, is have a phone while you're trying to get someone's attention. But we're gonna do some live polls and this should work for everybody here in person as well as, as those of you online. Um, when you get to this screen in a minute from the QR code, you don't need to register. You're just gonna go ahead and hit that skip button that you can see below the blue bar. So if you wanna take a minute and screen shoot this, that should get you in. You should have some do 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 do. Okay, everybody good? All right, so let's get started. This is called the blob tree, and these are blobs. Everyone calls them guys, but they're blobs it's because it's an HR exercise. And it may just be you, or you can use this exercise to think about the place that you most recently worked. But when you look at the situations that these blobs are in, which blob best describes how you and your employees think about working for your organization. So you should be able to just click on a blob or two or three, and we can start to see Ooh. how people feel. That's very cool. This is kind of spooky. <laughs> it's kind of Halloween-y right now. So we get the swinging, yeah, we get the swinging on the on the vine quite a bit, especially in scale up and starting businesses. Oh, we get a lot of hanging on the free fall makes me nervous. Look at the um the hanging. <laughs> anybody anybody physically here wanna wanna share? You're in the front row. Anybody? Okay, we'll get you a microphone. 
And if you don't mind, just introducing yourself quickly. Yes, I'm Jason Burke, CEO, founder of the High Performance System, and I'm an event coach and event expert. I picked number 11. Uh, that was more of like teamwork togetherness, you know, building a community. And that's where it more resonated with it. But I think of the company I'm building and how I want that to really feel and for people to join our team. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Thank you. So I've gone for the 16, 17, 18 area. I was tempted with 11 and 12, but it seemed a bit too friendly for too, too. my liking. So like 16, 17, 18 was more like championing each other and supporting each other in, in that sense. Good. Anybody brave enough to show the truth of the hanging by the limb or that's only the online audience? <laughs> Great. So as you can see, you know, this is an exercise I do often with um, with leaders and also employees. And it's, a, it, you know, if you sat a bunch of people in a room and said, tell me about the culture, that's really hard to answer. It's really difficult to do that. But show me how you're feeling. And sometimes we do this when we're auditing a certain department, interacting with IT. Um, right now, this is kind of a window of HR transformation for a lot of organizations. So I've been doing this with, you know, sort of cabinets and C-suites and sort of, you know, department managers who have been very frustrated with HR not being able to, you know, hire enough people quickly or do everything that they should be doing. And so we've done this exercise to sort of let them express how they're feeling about HR, and then we can kind of unpack that a little bit. But the blob tree is, um, if you Google it, you can probably find it online. It's not something proprietary to us, but I, I do think it's a fun exercise for you, for you all that and you can share it with your friends. So, okay. This one, a little morbid, but it is almost Halloween. So obituary. So if you had to write an opening statement for the obituary of your business, what would it say? Oh, so-and-so, they were the best at blank. You can take a minute or two to fill those in. Jody and I have closed the doors of many businesses. So <laughs> not because we messed up, but, um, <laughs> you know, the lots of reasons why, why businesses die. Obituary is when someone's passed away. So the she was, notice. she was the greatest comedian, you know, they had the best snacks. They, um, let me bring my dog to work. What are some of those? And we had free parking, honestly. It can be as minute or as important as possible. So I'm just gonna read some of these out as they come. So changing, Getting capital, coffee, the best coffee. That's a good one. Fast, shiny thinking. And this, you know, part of this exercise is to show no matter how amazing we think our companies are, what's really unique. And that's what's really difficult, especially I've had the pleasure, you know, with Janielle alone, but working with a lot of pharma and biotech companies. Um, many of them within, you know, stone's throw of here. And you can't just say, come work here because we're saving lives. You can't just say, you know, we have the smartest scientists in the world because everybody says that. Um, we've gone through an exercise when we were working, um, presenting to Janielle's team. And a, a major reason why people are joining is they have a fantastic executive leadership team. Really, really impressive. And I think without doing the research, my guess is that would have been the go-to. Let's make sure we talk about, you know, Jonathan, who's amazing, and the leadership team that's amazing. It's a very diverse team, lots of great things. And part of the exercise is we did take a look at some of the competitors in the thyroid eye disease space. And guess what? You go to their websites and their career sites, and every single one of them was, we have an amazing leadership team. So it is taking a step back and saying, okay, what... That's true, 
but what is it that's really going to be making an impact for us? And so many of you, a few people talked about, you know, fundraising. I want to illustrate the link between people and fundraising. Not all your employees are going to be out there fundraising. I love working in the sciences because the impact to even just one patient. I've worked on multiple sclerosis drugs, immuno-oncology drugs, fertility. We had a wall of babies on the fertility floor of EMD Serono, all the babies that were born from our fertility drugs. So it's very, very motivating to get me out of bed. Um, So you would think these very smart companies could raise money. And I will tell you, sitting in the executive suite, the companies that have efficacious science, or in, in your cases, a good product, get in the way of raising money and don't raise money because the people giving you money can see the dysfunction in your executive team or see a disconnect. So the people part of it is what they're also investing in. So you're going to put a lot of time and energy into your product, developing your product, thinking about it, but don't miss on the people piece as well. Because in a roadshow or in a funding meeting or after they come into the office and see people and meet people as you grow, they're going to be paying attention to that link. So I think, you know, when you look at this list, it's 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 a great list. And I think it's one that most of us could look at and say, oh yeah, that that's kind of true. So thinking a little bit about sort of your inner uniqueness is 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 key. We're gonna I want to make sure we have time for some some questions and we're gonna talk a little bit about we're gonna do one more exercise in a minute. But I think that we've sort of brought home the difference between sort of marketing and messaging and then culture. So Janielle, maybe just two minutes on this slide because I think that this is important for everyone in the room. And, and I'll say the people part, and I know as, as a growing, scaling business, we, we struggle every day with chicken and egg. We think we're going to get this contract. Do we hire people yet? What if we hire them and it doesn't go through? What if we get it and we can't deliver? Um, you know, what's the timing? Like, what should we be doing first? And I think there is a middle ground, which is pipelining. Do I know who I need to know? Do I have a sense of those types of of companies that I can like go out and get people from? Do I have a clear picture of when I think I might want to meet somebody? And that might not be someone you're offering a job to today. It's really, really easy to say and really hard to do as everybody is overextended and working really hard. (laughs) But that's why, you know, folks are opening up to thinking about outsourcing, you know, one of the companies that we worked at, they were switching to a new a, a new discipline they had never had, oncology. And, you know, that's people are embedded in that for, for decades. And even as the headcount was getting approved, we were already doing the research to say, who's here? Who do we think we might be able to talk to when you're ready? So on this slide, this is a good one for you to think about as you're building your business and and what can you do at your stage? Um, Are you going to be able to offer pay and benefits? But start with thinking about what are the skills that you need? What, What do you enjoy doing? What do you not enjoy doing that you should pass off and hire for? What are you doing that's a rate limiting thing? Like Jody and I, we've been doing this for eons, but we still do tons of administrative stuff. You're never going to get rid of all of it, but is are there things that you're doing that you should hire for because they're they're rate limiting items? And then start to think about okay, these are the skill sets that you're going to need to build and and to hire those people. What are you you going to need to to give to them? Um, from the benefits, from a compensation, from a work environment standpoint. I always build backwards. Um, It says a lot about me. Um, And then, you know, continue to craft your message or or work with someone externally um, to to craft your message and help hone that. Um, It's 
I don't write my own resume. I've been doing this for 25 years. I don't write my own resume. You know why? Because I've written thousands of them for people and it's, you, you get in your own head, you know, it's okay to take your messaging and say, I need another pair of eyes. I need someone to help me and make this resonate. Sometimes you're too, you're too technical or you're too scientific. You know, what do you do when you're a really technical company, but you need to hire an admin that doesn't need to understand how that box works? How is your messaging going to meet, meet and reach that person? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we were, we were joking about this earlier. You know, I think what's, what's difficult today is that it is a different world. Like it is very, very different to be working, running a business, you know, doing, we've never seen the market like this. You know, we're going to, you notice we haven't said the great resignation yet because that's getting little, you know, the great regret, the great return, the great whatever catchphrase of the week. But the talent market is unlike anything we either of us have ever seen. And it's not just, you know, new and career people. You have very senior people accepting jobs and not taking your job. You have very senior people taking your job and leaving in a month because they're still interviewing because they're working remotely. I'm seeing some expressions that that may have happened to some of you. So it's happened to us too. So it's, um, it's a new world. So the last thing, the last exercise I'm going to have you do, and then I'm going to, you know, make sure we go through a couple of measurable sort of things to know and some predictions for next year, and then certainly want to have time for questions. So we've talked a lot about benefits, attributes, different sort of magical Kool-Aid elements from your business. If there was one important attribute or benefit that you'd want to be known for, take a minute and let's see what that is. I would guess that was you if you didn't have your phone out. And I'm happy to see no one's saying their product. So we've been paying attention, which is great, which is hard. Janelle was asking me a good example, explain to people the difference. And, I, and I, I've done a lot of work over the years with Aspen Dental. And that's a really good example. If you're familiar with them, they their whole model is we go where no dentist has been before. So they're in very, very urban neighborhoods and very, very rural middle of like, I have to get a map to see where they're recruiting. And when you see their ads, it's very warm and fuzzy and it's welcoming. It's people who've been afraid to go to the dentist, who couldn't afford the dentist. Um, you know, very sort of don't be afraid and join us. And we're going to help you to work there you need to be the most hardworking, efficient dentist in the world. And they get the NYUs, the Tufts grads, they make a ton of money. They do everything that a, someone working as their sort of dentist in their neighborhood, they might get that experience over 10 years, they get it in 10, 10 weeks because they're running, they're running the practices, they have sort of outsourced support so they don't have to do things. So that employer brand of, hey, who we're looking for is the opposite of that consumer brand. And so I think that's a really sort of clear way to say it's not, it's not always the same. The look and the feel and the culture and the sort of values, that's where values might be the same. But be very honest about, regardless of how amazing your product is, you know, making babies, saving lives, you know, have the pleasure of working with Moderna. I mean, that's been amazing to, to be part of that team and trying to hire people for them. And when they called me in March, 2020, but that's not the experience of why someone wants to work there. So these are great words here. And Or uh, when I go to work for Patagonia, I shouldn't be driving a V8 gas guzzler <laughs> with my styrofoam Dunkin' Donuts no, no. coffee. I mean, th those are, that's a, a brand that, um, it's hiring practices do match it's outward facing yeah. and you kind of have to drink the Kool-Aid yeah. to work there. L.L. Bean, you know, you loved them, great client, but 
if you do not love the outdoors and want to, you know, see kayak and, you know, I, I, I love everybody there. It's been a great client, but I, I wouldn't, they wouldn't hire me. I don't fit the culture. So, so I think that that's, that's important to know. So here are a couple, five quick tips. I'm just checking on time here. Um, so the number of applications, and some of you may not even be at this state yet, or it's going to continue to decline. And it's going to decline because there's just an oversaturation. People are overwhelmed. And if people are applying, and I don't know if anyone's had this experience, you, you're like, oh, this person looks good. And you reach back out to them from LinkedIn, and they don't even know who you are. They don't even know the company. It's so frustrating. And you're like, why did you apply? And it's like, because I don't even, they're you know, watching TV. They're not even paying attention. So this is what I say is one of the trends that's going to continue. Everybody here has a smartphone. We just saw the applications and we just saw people participating. Be where people are. People are on their phones. So can you leverage channels that people are looking at, whether it's Google, social media, Instagram, Facebook? Um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with Emotional, but headquartered here. Um, so similar, you know, a couple of years ago, they were Hyundai, Apti, um, autonomous driving, joint venture. It just rolled off the tongue trying to recruit for that. And um, it wasn't even emotional yet. So being able to pipeline for them, knowing they were going to be emotional in September of 2020, and then being able to get that first inaugural brand out to them is key. So it's never too early to put a little bit of thought into getting that message across and building some excitement. And light apply means you're controlling that situation. So those applications are coming to you not to Monster or LinkedIn or Glassdoor or Indeed, who's going to put you hostage until you pay for each resume that may or not be may or may not be good. So that's that's one trend that I think is something that's going to stay. Um, diversity and inclusion is not a trend, and I think it is really something that is challenging when you're starting a business and scaling a business because traditionally it has been who do I trust? Good friend of mine, um, MIT grad, started a few businesses, sold them to EMC and the likes of that. And his whole network has been, yeah, this is the guy I went to MIT with, and this is the person I did this with. And I said, how are you doing with you know female leaders? How are you doing with people that you didn't go to MIT with? And he's like, oh, I'm not, not great at that. And as Janielle said, that's becoming a big issue for, for investors. And they want to they know that you're diversifying. And it's bad for your product. There's a ex-client of mine that shall remain nameless that has been a, a well-known incubator of, of startup companies. They only ever recruited from MIT and Harvard. What's wrong with that? You have employees who were trained to think two ways. And when you're in science and you're dealing with global science, uh, different socioeconomic needs. Do you have the NIH? Do you even have insurance? You can't be always recruiting out of the same pond. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have an advanced degree. I struggle some days to spell pharmaceuticals or therapeutics, but I know what it's like to go with a parent who's ill to a doctor's appointment and to help them think through, geez, how are we going to pay for all these prescriptions? That's invaluable in an organization that's trying to bring a drug to market. So if you're always fishing in the same pond, you're not bringing in the skill sets to look at your business the right way. Um, ERGs, employee resource groups, business resource groups, um, Part of why those are very successful is that you can start to pull people together across your organization, especially if you're hybrid or you are in multiple countries that have something similar, maybe different disciplines, maybe different tenure, uh, might be something like, you know, dealing with an aging parent, being a parent of a special needs child, um, being a, you know, a, a certain type of ethnicity. And it's amazing what that does as far as engagement and retention, because sometimes you're not going to find that person like for like that's in your work stream. And it's something that, again, 
some, I think the thinking was you want to wait till you have a certain number of employees before you do that. But I disagree. I think if you have 10 employees and you want to get a group together and it's something you should be, you know, shouting out right away. Um, I'm going to throw this one to you because I think this is probably a number one challenge that I'm seeing from when we are outsourced recruiting for clients and their, you know, COVID vaccination status is up there as well. So this is this is so multi-layered. One of the reason why Viridian is 50% women and 35% people of one or more diversity classification is because we we're remote. We are allowed to um, meet the needs of people at different stages of their life. As Jody said, you know, a parent uh, with a special needs kid, I'm a I'm a parent to one of my parents. Um, there, there are multiple layers of people who are not in the workforce or not willing to move jobs uh, because of the needs at home. And, and that includes um, for us and, and sciences, especially women and women in leadership who are oftentimes a caretaker. We have more women in our company because they are caretakers and they feel supported and that they can work for us remote. One of the things that we do well, and it's probably the only thing we do well remote, is on day one, everyone gets a really good technology setup. Actually, before day one, gets a really good technology setup sent to their home. Um, we have a 74-year-old employee who was like, oh my God, I just plugged it in and it worked. That's awesome. Um, and we have a very clear policy. Um, it's not like, well, you don't have to come to work, but I'll be here every Wednesday, wink, wink. Like we're very clear about it. What you say and what you do have to match. And that goes for any policy. Uh, I'm actually working on a project for a client right now that just said, you know, we need to be, we need to be aligned as an executive team because whether you're in the engineering department or in another department, there are different thoughts around that. And, and the, the CHRO said, we need, to, we need to stop and figure that out. So you don't have to be 100% remote. You just have to be clear about what you're saying and what you're expecting and doing. It also helps you when you're recruiting. So if, it might be that you know people can be in greater New England. They can be a, a quick flight away from Philly or New York, but you're gonna want them to be able to be in Boston when you need them to be. Might be a couple times a month may not be for a month, but knowing that up front and not, you know, what, what happens with candidates, especially when you're hiring your first stack of, you know, winning candidates into employees, everybody thinks that they're so special, you're going to change the rules for them. And, you know, candidates also were, you know, they lie, you know, we just did a project and it was very, very clear it had to be in person. As an HR, very critical HR BP position, which I think is like the number one position out there right now, a business partner to the business, gone through screens, gone through managers, gets the top person. Can it's like, mm, I really just want to be here two days a week. And it's like, no matter how amazing you are, that's not going to fit into the, the culture, the obituary, the what we just did. So just to wrap up, and certainly if there are questions online, please post them because we have a couple minutes left. Um, making sure you have that bold employer brand. So whatever it is right now, it's gonna change, it can change. Don't have that sort of paralysis that, well, we're gonna change our marketing in six months, or well, we might be adding this function. Like your people are your people. The reason why you want them there isn't probably gonna to shift too much. So just start with something. It can be simple, it can be a paragraph on your landing page. It could be, what you hand out to people that you're networking with at events like this week. So um, think about that. And I would say, you know, Jenny, I'll talk a little bit about this. People want to work for people, especially if, you know, you know, are they are they real? The technology, the work, the output's exciting, but what's your story? You know, and it's, it's we're not all comfortable doing that, you know, being able to talk about that. So we've started to do more and more around sharing our stories as an exec team. As Danielle mentioned, you know, I have, a, I have a daughter with special needs. It's amazing to me as, you know, I don't talk about it very often, but people I've known for years are like, oh yeah, my, my kid too. But like, it doesn't, you know, it was sort of like, you didn't bring it up. So 
that's what brings you together. That's what brings you customers. That's what brings you vendors. That's what builds your relationships. So take the time to just get your opinions out there. Talk about what's special, what's interesting, what you're excited about. I just had I just saw an organization that they went through RIF. So that's a reduction in force for tech roles. They they got a little overexcited with salaries. And the CEO was very transparent and just said, listen, this is what happened. This is what we did. This is what I'm doing. I'm moving off to go back to product. He was the founder and CEO. So to me, that would that would balance out all the glass door reviews because he's being honest and owning it. And that we all make mistakes. And you know, the last one is just be aware. Talent intelligence is key. Take a look. Look at who you have. Look at who your competitors have. Think about the sort of scenario planning of, wow, what would it be like in six months or a year or two years? Like, what's plan B, plan C if things change? Um, it, it sounds overwhelming and it's not. And there's lots of people out there to help with bits and pieces of that. Um, fractional workers, especially in HR, is kind of a newer trend. But how smart is that? You know, you don't necessarily maybe need a CHRO all the time, but one day a month might be critical to what you're looking to do instead of hiring a lot of junior generalist folks that are supposed to be in charge of hiring your next great hire, setting up your payroll. Like it's it there's there's so many options to outsource and systems. So the last slide here is just some predictions. Um, hiring managers, you need to be realistic and honest about what you want. So Jenny, I'll talk a little bit about this. Personality traits, do they all need to really come from the school or the alumni association that you know, or can we actually look for other people that are excited to come? Um, the, the flexibility, the scalability, it's a great time. It's a great time to be hiring. The, the world is your oyster. And the hardest thing is to figure out what you think you want and can you afford it? And if not, What's plan B? Is it taking someone a little bit more junior that someone's going to mentor so that you build in that person who's going to be loyal to you? The health and fundamentals of your business and making sure that employer brand is relevant and authentic for today. And the last one is just really take advantage of what's out there. There's so many tools. There's so many outsource partners. I mean, Janielle and I both are from Massachusetts. There is a parochial thinking here that, you know, we can do this ourselves. That's how we, that's how we roll. Um, UK as well. <laughs> and I think that what's happened with time poverty and just the Zoom fatigue and the back-to-back -back meetings is forcing many of us to say, maybe it's time to look at, can I outsource a piece of something? And, you know, years ago, 10 years ago, people thought it would be ridiculous to outsource benefits. That was the most important thing in the world. And now... Anyone who's not outsourcing benefits is it, that's that's just it, you know it doesn't make any sense because it's more efficient. You have the breath the breath and the breath of people. So it's we're all getting there, and it's lots of ways to fit and find someone to help you. Anything you want to add to that one? It's great. Yeah. So any any questions from from anybody here or anyone in the audience? I want to check and make sure we're good on time here. <laughs> Good on time. Yep. Um, just encourage anybody that's tuning in virtually, if you do have those questions, go ahead and pop them into the online Q&A. Does anyone in the audience in person have any questions? Thank you. Um, so we're just going through the journey of getting B Corp certified. How are you thinking that things like that, that authenticate what you're trying to get out as an employer brand will impact the whole area? So what does the certification mean? That it's genuine and approved. In, in B Corp, for example, it's approved by other B Corp certified businesses. Okay. I think it's legitimacy. So I think that absolutely, you know, people want to know the risk. And I think that's part of what, you know, what I'm finding right now, it's a balance. Most people today are seeing sort of great changes in their financial outlook from what they thought six months ago or two years ago. So any sort of third party certification that says, hey, your best places to work, hey, we're certified, hey, you've won this award, um, that really does help a comfort level if they haven't heard of you or your business, but they have this sort of accolade, shout it out. I mean, that's, I think, a really a good point. 
And the other thing I would say is how, or can you figure out what your differentiation is versus other? Um, it, Jody does this exercise where she puts up the statements of all of our competitors. We all just say the same darn thing. We want to save lives, we're, but you have to take your messaging down um, about about what's different. And so, if you're coming out and saying, "Yep, we're B Corp certified," and but then taking that that messaging down to the next level and figuring out what's unique, um, because it's that's just a, a door opener, right? Cool. Thank you. Anybody else? Other questions, comments? Okay. I think another helpful question actually might be for folks that are very early on in their startup journey that are just having these conversations for the first time. Are there any maybe actionable tips you can give, any helpful exercises to kind of get this like thought pattern flowing and really kind of distill down what makes your company unique and why would people want to work there? Yeah. I mean, I think when you think about um, some of the exercises we did, so outside of what, on a piece of paper, what do you do? How do you do it? How do you do that? And is it a place where people kind of have a chance to work, you know, come here and have a, have a cube and do their own thing? And that's what you're looking for is folks that don't want to have a lot of meetings and just get on with it. Then that's important to, to say. Um, is it a place that is really looking at collaboration and expecting folks, whether they're technical or not technical, to actually have conversation and have meetings? And, uh, you know, it's it seems like a simple request, but at the end of the day, what do you see is going to be your key to success of being able to, to, to grow the team? And when, you know, I... I had an event the other day um, across the street, actually, for I'm on the board of a group called the Women's Edge. It's a women's leadership it used to be called Commonwealth Institute. And my first employee in the U.S., actually, I didn't even tell you this, Danny, um, she worked in my kitchen in Natick for a couple of weeks. And now she's an attorney it was 10 years ago. And um, she came to the event and we ran into some of my old clients. But it's it's sort of like, how do you keep those relationships and you know, you're not always going to have the same employees and people are going to come and go, but are they going to come and go with a good experience? Are they going to be a good referrer? Are they going to be able to um, tap into their network? It may not be for them, but they may know somebody. That's really important. And I think people take that for granted when they're starting out. Um, my very first job in Boston was I was a reporter for Neighborhood Network News. For those of you who get Channel 3, I think it's still Channel 3. And then I worked for a startup television station, Channel 68. And I was 22 years old and the general manager gave me a pile of resumes and said, tell me who you know and who you don't know, because I had been trying to be a reporter. So I had gone up and down. I had interviewed tons of network, you know, tons of news directors. I was 22. I looked 12. They were not hiring me for that. I've made a career shift. But um, people that were not nice got in the no pile. So at a very early age, I learned, do not discount a 23-year-old admin because you don't know who they're talking to. So just keep that in mind. Be nice to everybody. And that brings up a good point. If you don't know what you want, start with what you don't want. What, you know, I don't want my work environment to turn into this. I don't want my company to be seen as this. Sometimes it's just easier to start with what you don't want until you build towards the vision of what you really do want. Um, and you know, if you can make a LinkedIn page for your company, do it and do that one thing. Well, like if you have enough stuff to put out there, Jody, I would say like, you know, do that one thing, do it well until you can get to, you know, some of the examples Jody shared of, you know, can you do Facebook? Can you do Instagram? Um, you know, you don't have to boil the ocean. Don't, don't feel like the same thing. I know we're like <laughs> moms here. Don't boil the ocean kids. Yeah. Um, yeah, but don't, don't be nervous that you have to now go run out and do all these things. We're in a digital world, right? If it doesn't work, take it down. If it works, spend more time on it. And that's, it's experimenting. That's what we're, that's what we're doing. So, um, like we said at the beginning, it's, it's a really different time. Um, it's an exciting time. 
And, you know, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, be happy to see what we can do to help and, um, you know, appreciate the time today. It's always great to be at this event and um, hopefully this was useful to you all. So thank you. Good luck, everyone. Thanks. Thank you.